podcaster fails to capture audio quality. Tragic news in Revachol today as Disco Elysium podcaster, the 41st Precinct, discovered that not only did OBS fail to record the first half hour of Montaigne's audio, but the compressor settings also caused his dialogue to miss words and have weird gaps. Satellite officer Jean Vicmer, the officer on scene, had this to say. This isn't any surprise, he's always fucking something up, just once I'd like him to get everything right. A statement from the 41st Precinct said, Fuck Jean, I'm no professional, I'm doing my best here, and there's still over 90 minutes of great Montaigne chat. The podcast isn't about me, it's about the guest, so just listen to what they have to say. The 41st Precinct hasn't been heard from since. Eurovision then so <laughs> that has like i don't know whether you see it as that but i'm not a eurovision watcher but in mm. in europe obviously i am it's a huge deal, yes right oh, it's so big yeah so how was that experience and i guess really like that's a level of fame that maybe even yourself was like what's going on here so i'd like to know what your experience was like doing that um, I, I feel like it's funny because I would get asked this question like pretty close to when I finished doing Eurovision. I think I would water down my answer quite a lot because I still had a bit of heat on me and stuff. But like now that a lot of time has passed in retrospect, I'm like, oh, it's, it was not meant for me. <laughs> like it was something that I wanted to try to do because I like novel experiences. And I like pushing myself, but like, um, it is a, I think it is a contest best suited to people who were like trained to be performers. And I was not trained to be a performer. I, you know, have my own style and it's very unrefined and very unpolished and I like it. And it works for a lot of people. A lot of people are drawn to me because of my vulnerability and imperfection and chaos. And Eurovision does not like that. <laughs> that Eurovision is kind of like K-pop in that there are like unrelenting standards for the performers yeah. and the way that they appear, the way that they move, the way they behave, the way they answer questions and interviews, everything is like judged as if you're judging gymnastics. Like oh, it's, really? yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's, uh, you know, obviously not every single person that watches Eurovision behaves in this way, but there is a very fanatical, I guess, Stan like aspect of the fandom that is like incredibly toxic and judgmental and cruel. And I did not like that. And it, I, it wasn't that I didn't like it because it was like, I, I, I think my sense of self at this point in my life is actually quite steady, which was, um, you know, I'm glad that it, it was that way at the time that I was attempting to do Eurovision, but like even with the steadiness of my sense of self that I had, like I, I felt a bit like under the pump, you know, like it was, I, I think it's because, you know, there is the global community, but then especially the community that um, you're representing, like Australians, it was like the Australians that were the most savage. They were like, I don't think Montaigne should be representing us. They're like, uh, they're, you know, clown person or whatever. They've got like, uh fucking hair above their lip and all this shit right like just i have no problems living the way i live and looking the way i look i've chose i've made these decisions <laughs> to like live like this and a lot of people in my life uh do not bat an eyelid at the way i look and the way i act and stuff like that and my fans don't right um but like suddenly yeah it was like the, world. the rhetoric that was being thrown around was like you're representing the nation and i'm like that is true but like what do we want our nation to be <laughs> you know yeah. like can our nation not be represented by like you know kid of migrants person of color queer like kind of freaky and weird in in their choices can not even this is the thing i'm not even that freaky or weird like <laughs> no you're not i'm you're just not. like a bit more different compared to conventional taste you know like but it was just it, that kind of energy i was like god it sucks like it's just ugly like it was just really ugly and doing the actual so that's like the public reception right and then the actual doing of it I guess the rest is kind of on me because I think I thought there would be a bit more like support 
Mm. Like I thought maybe someone was going to book me like a choreographer that I met up with like once a week to train and to like go through the stuff. But it was more like I met up with someone like once every month or every eight weeks. He, who was the choreographer sort of assigned to the thing? But it was like up to me to be practicing on my own in the interim. And I lived in like a rental with like three other people, no space to fucking practice dancing. And if I practice dancing, I'm bothering them, you know, like, I don't <laughs> like, yeah, I feel, just wish there had like been you should a, have had the state behind you. Right. Or at least, you know, a little bit more. Yeah. This is the thing. You don't get money. Like you don't, they don't give you money to like work on your performance. And I didn't have money to pay a personal trainer or anything like I, or maybe theoretically I did, but it would like take away from another aspect of my life because I'm not rich and like, you yeah. know, all that stuff. So that was really challenging because again, it's like you're trying to meet these exacting standards, but then you don't have the resources to do so. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it was crazy. Yeah. It was like crazy. And uh, yeah, just, and then of course there was the pandemic and I, you know, came back for the second year and then I couldn't even go to Europe and do my final performance because. That's right. I saw of, that you had to like, did you, was your performance like streamed from somewhere else? Or it wasn't even streamed. I did it several months in advance in Sydney in just like a small studio there, pre-recorded it. And then they just played the video on the night. And like, you know, it's funny, a lot of, critical people will be like Montaigne sucked so bad they're the only person that didn't go to the grand final of all Australian entrants ever and it's like I wasn't there mm. like I didn't get to do any of the press I didn't get to do any of the parties I didn't get to talk to people I didn't get to endear myself to audiences and fans I didn't get to show my face at the flag ceremony I didn't get to do any of that stuff and they played a video back you know, like yeah. for my performance in a tiny space with nowhere near the specifications that they had in Amsterdam or not yeah. Amsterdam in, um, in, uh, God, oh, you know, in the Netherlands. It was in the Netherlands. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm trying to, it was that port city. I can't suddenly can't remember. Rotterdam. It. Anyway, it Rotterdam? Rotterdam. Rotterdam. That's it. Rotterdam. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, it's just the whole thing was just like, I'm really glad I did it because it helped me realize a lot of things about myself and it gave me the strength to know that I can weather that process and like do all of it. And that's really cool. But in retrospect, I'm like, yeah, no, I definitely wasn't the, <laughs> the right it, person it, to send, I don't think. Did it put you off yeah. like the the world of famous people that experience because there's like I, there's levels to it right like there's your taylor swift yeah. who's like you know, mm. right, right at the top and then there's you know you kind of you find levels of fame um yeah no exactly did, did that I, put look, you off? I i've yeah i've never <laughs> the i've never like been drawn to fame which might sound strange as someone who works a profession that makes you famous but like <laughs> I didn't even I wasn't even like again I got into music by accident and sure I kept applying myself and kept going with it but like that was because I loved music and I loved making it and I loved performing and I think I'm quite good at singing and performing wow. so I Eurovision not phased by that aspect of it I think like you say there's different levels and um shades of fame and stuff and I think you know, there were some people at Eurovision that I got along with even remotely and we connected and like Daddy Ferrer, who's like the Icelandic um, contestant, he loved my music and I loved his music and we ended up making a song together. That was really cool. And like same with Katarina from um, uh, Go A, like she was really cool too. Um, but then, yeah, I guess like I may not, if I had gone, to the Netherlands and been there and done the red carpet and all that stuff. Like I, I can be like charming and, and, <laughs> you, you know, very chatty. <laughs> well, thank you. I can be charming and chatting and charismatic, but it's not like a, a kind of charisma. It's not like an actor kind of charisma, if you know what I mean? Yeah. Like where they really know what to say. So I'm very like, my charisma comes from just like being quite, um, well, not unfiltered, but You've like. You've got a lot of energy, I think. I got energy and I think it's all very natural. Like yeah. I don't, I'm not trying to be someone, you know what I mean? I think sometimes in, so I tell you, you know, I went to the Grammys this year and that was weird because I did brush with and encounter people who 
um, were very conscious of the way that they were being perceived and wanted to be perceived as like, you know, mightier than or, or greater than, you know, and I hated that. <laughs> yeah. I like, oh God, it's so ugly to me. I just, it's not a feeling I relate to. And, um, and I don't know, I guess, yeah, you also see it with the, the chapel and stuff. I feel such a strong impulse to sure, defend her yeah. right now because I think I see a lot of myself in her, both in like political opinion and style of music. And, and we're both curly haired queer people, right? Like, and yeah. <laughs> Yeah. With, with big voices. And um, I just like, yeah, just. You made, the, you the, made the, a very the... nice uh, point about that day on you. You related it to being bullied, but like half of your school, which is a very, very good way. Yeah. I think the interesting thing about that whole situation is like all the criticism I see is people saying, well, there's actually multiple valences of the criticism. One of them is the political aspect because she won't endorse. Kamala Harris, which is perfectly reasonable, I think. So, like, a lot of liberals are, like, going after her. And then the other one is people are like, she's cancelled two shows. This is becoming a pattern. Like, she's uh, flaky and she's got commitments and stuff. And it's like... She almost maybe sounds it looks human. Like, yeah, well, no, also, though, like, if you strip it of all context, then, yeah, maybe she is a soft little person, soft, fragile person who can't handle... The situation but as it stands she's being attacked by like fucking democrats online she's being attacked by fascists and queer phobes who don't like that she's a lesbian who loves drag artists she's being attacked by people who claim they're her fans <laughs> because she cancelled one 1500 person cap show it's like there are more people upset about her cancelling that one show than yeah. they were ticket holders to that show. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. As is often the case crazy. on yeah. the internet, right? You, you, yeah. you, you hear the noise. Like people, um, give you a great example. The Last of Us Part 2 is mm. hated by everyone on earth if you look on the internet. But like <laughs> yeah. 90% of them never played it. They saw that, um, yeah. spoilers, Joel dies. Yeah. Like, no shit. Yeah. It's it's yeah. like, and they just see it as like a LGBT uh, propaganda message mm. written by a Zionist. Yeah. I mean, it has its issues, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Not the LGBT bit, but people latch on <laughs> latch onto that stuff and attack it yeah. without really having any idea about what. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's just forgive her for seeing the millions, if not hundreds, I guess hundreds of thousands comments online saying like you're a terrible person because of this, that or the other. Or like I couldn't imagine walking out on a stage after seeing just an onslaught of negative public opinion about me and like I just can't. I'm sure that crowd would have greeted her warmly, but she was in a headspace whereas like, I just can't she imagine a know, world in she? which that's the case. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah it's yeah. like, anyway, so I'm very, like, I'm very defensive of her just because I, like, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to be in her position. I don't, I think I'm, this is the fun thing about Chavo Rowan is she got mega super famous um, and, like. Pretty much at, overnight at a, as well, wasn't it? Well, this is the thing. At such a rate in, at such a rate that, like, her left, leaning opinions were not a deterrent to her becoming famous where I have had a slow burn career for like 10, 11 years. Right. Like I I've been just slowly, but surely like I had a really quick rise sort of like at the beginning of my career and then it's sort of plateaued. It's just been very small, steady gains throughout. And that, I like it like that just yeah. FYI. Um, and this is the thing I don't see myself ever having a meteoric rise. Cause I think it, I think I'm, I think I'm on blacklists somewhere because I'm like, you know, vocally pro-Palestinian anti-Zionist. Um, yeah. I disparage brands and companies, you know, freely because I don't think and they there hold, are they friends. They hold all and, the keys, right? They do. Yeah. They do yeah, hold all and, the keys. And I just think I'm definitely, there's a list somewhere that I'm on that says don't give right the top. Of, of a <laughs> massive commercial scale to this person because maybe not also like people my peers and friends are like yeah no, like you know probably not like but I, I do 
I don't you, know. I can, I can think of a, a few people who dislike the way I am outspoken in public. Um, but I, yeah, but Chapel Rowan's got there and now she's outspoken in public and now she's like, you know. Beating it big time. Top, yeah, yeah. I I can I can't handle a negative comment on fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and it will be just like a completely valid criticism. Like, please don't hate <laughs> me. <laughs> so um, yeah. you touched on the Grammys, right? This is absolutely mm. amazing. So Stray Gods is a RP, quite a short game, I think. Um, mm, yeah, and you were part of a team. So. Forgive me if I get this wrong. So there's Tripod. Is Tripod mm-hmm. the main group that were behind Soundtrack and you were part of it? Yeah, it's sort of Tripod, who's three guys, and Austin Wintory, and they were sort of like the main writers yeah. of the music on the game. So you talked a little bit about your Grammy experience. Sounds mm-hmm. like everything. I, I, a little bit like the Oscars <laughs> Vanity Fair party. But lots of insanely rich and um being insanely rich mm. but yeah. what we really care about is the fact that on that game cast is i don't say the three main ones give me for me but roy baker uh laura bailey and ashley williams who are of course i've just mentioned uh, the last of us two three mm. of i would say probably like ashley birch and i uh, forget the guy's name who plays kratos but if you were to like pick out names from the game, those three would come. Mm. So, did you get to work closely with them? Was there, you know, what was the what was the the process there? Mm. I actually didn't have any contact with them at all. I did get to meet Troy, I think like last year because he came down for South by Southwest in Sydney and we performed together, which was really amazing. He's oh, amazing. a fantastic musician and singer, so that was really cool. Um, but no, Austin was sort of the the conductor of all operations and I was doing stuff in Sydney and they were all doing stuff in LA. So like I was just sending over my files to Austin and sending voice memos and we were doing Zooms and then he was just giving those files to the actors basically um, to perform. So yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't really get any contact. It would have been cool, but I, you know, it was also during – you know, partly during the pandemic that we of started course. doing this work. So I couldn't have even flown over to the US if I wanted to. Um, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's um, it's still it's an amazing thing to be nominated for a Grammy. That must have felt like top of the world stuff. So, uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> who, who, it's like, who beat you yeah. to the award? <clears throat> it was Star Wars. I don't remember the name of the composers. I did meet them at the party, but um, it was the Star Wars game that came out. Jedi Last year. Survivor. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I I didn't play the game, so I don't know what the music was like. But it's Star I'm Wars. sure it must have been very good. I mean huh? it, it's basically just Star Wars y like strings and Yeah. Yeah. Well, people. here's a bit of an insider scoop. I heard that apparently the EA guy was like really lobbying the Grammy like the recording uh, can be very hard because that's what it is. It's like, it's about lobby. It's about saying, Hey, you should, because also, with, especially with games, like musicians aren't thinking about video games, like video games as a category or like soundtracks and, and scores is a two year old category in the Grammys. And like, the recording academy is not fucking playing stray gods of star wars so they need someone to go to them and tell them like this is why you know you should vote for our game blah 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 and yeah i heard just like the guy at ea was really dogged he was like i want we want this and that's you know they want it so good on you ea guy yeah well they've got (laughs) they've got the money and the clout haven't they exactly yeah Yeah. um So I did spy you'd shared something on uh, about a production team called High Score. Mm, it's uh, they're actually not, it's not a production team. It's a games conference. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, they do a couple of days. It's just two days, and it's sort of workshops, panels. Um, I think there's some interactive elements um but i'm speaking on the closing keynote panel with Yon from Tripod about our work on Stray Gods. Or the main event yeah. <laughs> kind of i think there's some <laughs> really cool people who are going to be in for it i can't remember who they are but um 
you know, closing, closing is nothing to, to insert phrase here. <laughs> <laughs> to batter, yeah. to, I don't know. To shout about? Is. Is, he look, is that the word you're looking uh, for? Uh, maybe the opposite meaning of that. I was actually talking about this with my partner recently because um, I realize when when you're raised by immigrants for whom English is not their first language, you don't hear a lot of idioms or figures of speech growing up. So it's ah, okay. not a strength of mine. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I'm always reaching and can never find. Yeah. What is that phrase I'm... that literally everyone else uses? I didn't grow up. Can't find. Yeah. Um, just one more about music, and then we're going to talk a lot about. It. Okay. Awesome. Um, you've been up front recently uh, for your social summer action, based about kind of moving away, etc. Going a lot. Mm. Utilize Patreon. Um, and I said to you at the start of the show. Keeping up with your whirlwind of life is actually hard. The difference in stuff that's available to talk about now compared to what it was when we first got in touch is insane. Mm. So I will let you tell us about the Patreon and what's new, what's coming up. Because I know that you've got a new song, you've got a podcast come in. Mm. <laughs> tell us. Yeah, so uh, I was managed and signed with a licensing deal with a Sony joint venture for 10 years. And that was really good for the first maybe five, six years. And they did build my career to a place where I could do it full time, which is really awesome. And I'm still doing it full time, which is the dream. Um, but I think after the pandemic, everyone sort of just like lost a bit of zest and a bit of energy. And I think I was not as new a project for them anymore. And again, my progress had plateaued a little bit. And I think they're kind of just like, they weren't as passionate about supporting me anymore. And, but they didn't tell me, like, it was kind of just something I discovered over time where I was like, I just hear from them as much anymore, you know? And so, and the other thing is like, you know, in 2022, I made this album that had David Byrne on two songs and Daddy Fair on another one and Michael Lupte, who's like lesser known, but she, she's sort of, sort of mid career in Japan. Um, on my album and I thought it was a really solid album full of pop songs and the album didn't do much. And that was a product not just of my label and my management, but also of the way that social media was evolving from an image based sort of feed to a video based feed. And I was not ready for that transition because yeah. <laughs> I was not comfortable with doing video stuff. I'm still not really, but I'm trying. Um, and, but I do also just think my management didn't, they weren't passionate about the album that I'd made um, and they didn't invest a lot of money into the marketing of the album, which I was like, that's like, that's like the death of an album. Why even make that album if we're not going to try and get people to hear it? So, but okay. anyway, so it was just like all that stuff. And I was like, you know what? I need to cut loose. A lot of things happened. I broke up with my long-term partner. I stopped talking to my parents, like all this shit and moved house and whatever and i was like i just need to change my entire life like i need to leave my management I need to leave label i have to figure out what i'm doing now and who i am and so that's sort of after like six to eight months of searching for who well not this is the thing i kind of knew who i was i just need to figure out how to structure my business in accordance with who i was because i went i'm not really like a label person i don't think and like yeah, uh, the thing that was becoming clear as well, like you say, is like, I like doing a lot of different stuff. I'm in podcast land, I'm doing video game music, I'm doing um, theater, I was in a theater production, I was on TV, like in a show in Australia, like I do a lot of different stuff and I like doing a lot of different stuff, but my managers, a, a lot they of the stuff I was- They keep you on track, I guess, right? And, and Well, I think, I think like the big issue was like, I was getting a lot of jobs, but I was getting them by myself. And like, they were still getting a 25% cut of everything I was doing. I was like, you didn't earn this. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like why are you getting 25% of what I do when I got the job anyway? So, um, it was just all that stuff. And I realized doing something like Patreon or a more independent model would be a way, well, to rewind a little bit again. I had a lot of meetings with managers after I left my managers to be like, what do you reckon? And a lot of them said to me, like, 
your audiences are too dispersed. Like you have an audience from Eurovision, you have an audience from your records, you have an audience from Twitch stream, you have an audience from all these different things that you do, but how do we actually get them to be one whole listening to your music audience? Yeah. And I was like, great question. I reckon it's possible. <laughs> like, but none of them, all of them thought it was just like an insurmountable challenge that they weren't willing to apply themselves to, which is fine because they're all also have their own artists currently and like all this stuff. So I was like, I get it. But also I just felt like they sort of didn't see the vision either. And I was like, I can see the vision. So I need to do this and I'm just going to self-manage. I'm going to figure out how to make this happen. And that's sort of what the Patreon is. Patreon is for people who see me like doing stuff with Auntie Donna and Tom Cardi and um, David Byrne and my own solo music and my stuff with Stray Gods and my Twitch streaming, all this stuff. And I like, I like the totality of that stuff. I like that someone like Montaigne exists out there who has a really interesting, strange career. And I want to keep supporting that person on their journey to do that. So that's sort of, I guess, the ideal fan supporting me there and then the stuff I'm offering to people there is pretty simple like I don't I'm too busy to like offer any more than this honestly yeah. um but you know three dollars USD per month you get like access to all like my text posts and some work in progress mp3s and just like little treats here and there of just like updates and stuff and then my five dollars USD tier patrons get like a special song once a month, which is like a pretty much a fully formed song in demo form that was never mixed or mastered that um, didn't get a release because it just didn't fit on an album, but that I deemed to be like high quality, but probably will never release basically. Novelty, that song you mentioned before, is actually the first song I posted, but it's ironic because I will probably now <laughs> release it, it because yeah. it's had really strong... <laughs> feedback but like you know to illustrate you know i posted one today called casual um and there's a story to go with that which i'll explain very short and concisely which is that like i worked with um i made the song it's called casual it had similar themes and energy to chaperone song casual it was okay. basically the same where it's like uh you know i can't do casual basically <laughs> because yeah, of yeah, all yeah, these yeah. reasons. Yeah. And I got an email from one of the guys that I like co that co-produced on this demo. And he was like, Hey, long time, no speak. But I wondered if you thought about like how this song sounds like Olivia Rodrigo is good for you. And I never thought about it. He was like, I just can't stop thinking about it. I was like, I'd never noticed the connection, but I guess I hadn't heard this demo for a very long time. And then I listened to the demo. I was like, oh yeah, the verse melodies are like the same, basically. Oh, okay. And there was no way Olivia or Dan Nigro would have heard this song. It was unreleased. Unless someone was passing around industry, like I don't know how they would have heard it. And I don't think people were passing it around. So um and I was just like, look, I'm not gonna <laughs> approach them or litigate or whatever because I just don't think there's any way that they stole this from me. I think it's just like a funny coincidence. It is an extra funny coincidence though that like the same guy who works with Olivia De Nigro also works with Chapel and she produces a song called Casual, which is just very strange. Mm. But basically I explained all this in the Patreon post and and shared the song and because that one can never come out. Like if well, I really said that people will be like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people will say yeah. you copied Olivia Rodrigo. It's like, no. <laughs> like, that didn't yeah. Anyway, so that that's the sort of stuff I'm offering there. Um and it's been great. And it's very sort of uh at the beginning of its life. Like I think I've had it for like two months now, but I'm hoping I can keep it up long term. And um hopefully it becomes the equivalent of a label where it's just like that's what's paying for me to make records yeah. because yeah. records are expensive to make, basically. No, I think it's yeah. I think it's amazing. I love seeing people like yourself who aren't content because I feel like this myself, right? Um mm. who aren't content with just like doing always something going on in the brain, some sort mm -hmm. of like inspiring little thing that well basically I'm I don't know if you you feel the same, but it feels like my brain is like spaghetti tentacle time and I'm constantly like, oh, I wanna do this and then I wanna do that and I wanna Yeah. So it's good that you, but you, you formulate them a lot better than I get ideas and drop them about halfway through because I can't. 
<laughs> I'm usually like that as well, but with this like album cycle, I have a team that's helping me with like marketing uh, okay. and stuff, and they have been holding me to things, and it's scary, but I'm I've committed, and I'm I'm ready I'm ready to do it. No, it's a good thing I think because like I don't get a lot of stuff done because I haven't got a someone on my shoulder saying um, yeah yeah pull yourself together. Um, it's so important, man. Like I just I literally I'm. T- I'm not one of those people who's like really pressed by capitalism to like be productive at all times. Like I could happily just play video games, not do very much for a Same. very long time and not feel guilty about it at any point. So I do, I need that person tapping me on the shoulder being yeah. like, dude, you gotta, you gotta meet your deadline. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to quickly ask you, um, cause everyone will hate me for not asking <laughs> Tom Cardi um oh yeah what was it like working with tom obviously like red flags is one of those yeah. hits like it's like it's a big social media hit right you get a lot of it on like mm. tiktok and shorts and, stuff. and it's yeah. a very good song uh, so what was that experience like with you but for you with tom yeah um tom's just my friend like oh, yeah, okay. we both just came up in the same circles i think a lot of people are like how do these guys meet it's like he's just my mate and like yeah uh first used the word mate sort of... by the way on a british australian <laughs> um <laughs> conversation <laughs> um yeah the australian counter begin now um yeah he i don't know i also at the time like lived around the corner from him so i was on this like you know i mentioned before i was on tv and i was on this production of like a musical comedy um for sbs which is just like again one of our sort of state funded uh tv networks here and i was working with a bunch of our friends his friends who are all sort of in comedy and write sketches and stuff and tom was also he was doing the music for that um show yeah. so we were already sort of talking to each other at least had adjacency and halloween was rolling around and he was like wouldn't it be crazy if you came and like sang on this song I've written? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to, like, let's do it. You know, um, I really like Tom's music or what I'd heard. And yeah, it was just like, I literally came off shoot that day and went to his house and we like recorded it in like two hours. And then it became one of the most significant songs of both yeah. of our lives. Like, it's crazy. It's just, yeah, it was so, um, just like it's really, to us, it it's, just like, it's like it's really yeah. catchy, and yeah, I know it's very silly, and I'm probably going to mm. add pretension here that doesn't exist. But there is a message. <laughs> there is a message there. Like you'd, you'd be forgiven for thinking it's just a silly, uh, jokey song about the human centipede, right? Yeah, yeah. But actually, if you, <laughs> yeah, well, I am, I am adding pretension here. I can sense it. But there is a message Please that like on. you should, you shouldn't judge people because they think um human centipede is a tour de force with the best costume design writing <laughs> uh like there's a line yeah. in the song like uh i can't remember is it like you're putting a blocker up on the best relationship you had or something like oh it's like so how do you how do you silly little red light do not take a chance on the best relationship you've never had that's yeah. it yes thank you yeah, yeah i'm yeah. glad you sang that and didn't leave me to do it thank you <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's honestly yeah. brilliant. I love it. It's a really catchy, really funny song. A lot of people. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I'm very grateful for it. It's been genuinely like somewhat life changing and has buoyed me a little bit as an independent artist. Like, yeah, it, yeah. You can get away with it, right? You, you, like, you can do a song like that, and the uh, this is where the internet's brilliant. They love that mm. stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, just one little message there to everyone. Go and check out uh, Montaigne's Patreon and give them all your money. Simple as that. And you'll get, <laughs> you'll get, lots, yes, of, please. <laughs> you get lots of cool music. <laughs> um, right, the main event now, yes. Let's talk disco. I'm excited. This is the best bit. Um, sorry to dismiss everything we've talked about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But it is. So tell me, when did you first play Disco Elysium? What was your history of disco? I played it in 2020 during the pandemic. We were locked down. Um, I was with my partner at the time and people, I mean, I guess we were just bored and we were like looking for a game because there was nothing to do. And 
uh, yeah, we'd seen people recommending it. And I was like, you know what? I'm curious. I'm going to dive in. And literally as, fun, uh, <laughs> literally as soon as like the first scene started, I was like, oh, this is a special game. Um, yeah, I think it was honestly made more special by playing it during lockdown. It was. Reed, I did the same, yeah. Yeah, because I, I could really immerse myself in the world. I didn't have to think about or do anything else, <laughs> you yeah. know, and so I just, like, lived in Revachol for, like, a week or two or however long it took for us to – it's kind of taken us that long to play the game because we were addicted to it. Um, but, yeah, it, it was just – it was the best, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's the greatest game of all time. It's, um, mm. How would you sell the idea of Elevator Pit, particularly? someone who hasn't played it i actually had to do that today i had a like a, a what would you call it like a set designer like someone who builds little props and sets and stuff come over this afternoon to talk about doing some stuff for my project and um i was explaining how disco elysium has influenced my record and, and sort of the atmosphere and the energy of the record and he doesn't play video games at all. He has a partner who does, but like he doesn't play video games. And I explained what Disco is, which is like, you know, it's this game about a detective that you play who wakes up not knowing who he is because he is an alcoholic and abuses drugs and has <laughs> uh, drunk himself into um, amnesia. And you go downstairs and someone says hey you have to solve a murder now <laughs> and you're like okay cool literally what's my name yeah. and um and you know that's sort of the the early pitch right um and then i guess the the later pitch is that it takes place in this broken poverty stricken world and city that exists in the aftermath of a communist revolution that was thwarted. And there is so much pathos. There is so much heartbreak. There is so much um, drinking <laughs> yourself <laughs> to stupor. And um, because of, I guess, the abjection of this place and your newbornness to this place, there is like a spark of beauty that emerges from your very pure interactions with people. Um, yeah, I, I, that's sort of a fantastic is another pitch, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank you. And also, you know, what I would add is like it's also extremely funny and i don't know how it gets away with that in a game that's so poignant <laughs> it's that like is, well yeah. no I, I i do know how it gets away with that i think honestly that's why i love it so much is because i deal with things similarly i'm i'm very you know deal with the darkness with humor yeah. um and so very much my my style yeah many of us do I, so i had a, uh, the previous episode of the podcast was with paul looney mm. god please and um, it's interesting because everybody starts with the pitch about it being because, like, if you're going to sell something to someone, you go with the hungover detective who knows what's going on. Mm. But he rightly pointed out, really not what the about. Like, it's, no. it's so much deep, so much more thought out. Um, and I love that you touched on the fact that it's really fun. like I gen I think it's the funniest game. That up there as one yeah. of the funniest people that I've ever yeah. experienced. I still find stuff now in hysterics or even stuff that I've seen before and you can't forget about it. It's really, really Yeah. But yeah, great, great pitch. Should um whatever they do next be in charge of mine. <laughs> um, God no, I I mean that's why it's also so super special about the game, right? Is it's just fabulously written. Like the the ability of the full writing team to write this beautiful interactive prose is actually um, like, what's the word? Virtuosic. Yeah. I just, every phrase is crafted so lovingly and well. And yeah, it's just, it's, you know, I, I would not, I know I'm a songwriter and so like concision is vital, but 
Ironically, concision is not my strong <laughs> suit and my prose is fucking miserable. <laughs> like I was that kid in high school who wrote essays and it would just meander for like 3,000 words and the teacher was like, okay, what was your point? <laughs> like that, that was my vibe. Anyway, I, I can relate to that. Don't worry. Um, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm having to learn um, podcast is not about me rambling <laughs> on at people for hours, so I have to try and control myself. Um, yeah, no, I get you. Who's your favourite character in the game? It's a really hard question because there's so many awesome characters, but I think my favourite character is probably Acel. Um, I don't know. Maybe she's the most relatable. I'm definitely not like Acel in any way, but I think she is one of the the more her and like the dice maker are probably some of the better adjusted characters. Not to say that they have their lives together, although the dice maker kind of does have her life together, but like a cell just sort of has like a sort of. They're very um, content, aren't they? The two of them. Yeah. And resilient, I would say like in, and in a sort of quiet way, not in a, I don't know. You could say that, um, fuck, what's his name? I've forgotten suddenly the guy who calls you tequila sunset. What's his oh, name? Oh, um, idiot doom spiral. Yeah, it, it, you could say he has a resilience, right? <laughs> but it is a very different type of resilience, and it's sometimes self defeating. Yeah, <laughs> it's so, it's sometimes it's like that is the fucking funniest story. He is so like, funny. I lost I lost my keys, and then I lost my apartment. It's like, the, like, the, the, the level of <laughs> um, insane excuses he makes for himself. Like, yeah, he yeah. Lo he lost his keys, but he'd already fired the best lock replacement. It's, it's like all of these yeah. incredible Crazy. reasons it's not his fault. Um, yeah, and and yeah. It, have you ever have you ever pursued the ultra liberal? political vision quest i um i don't think i don't think i have so, i don't think i have i did the communist one i did the moralist one i didn't i watched the playthrough of the fascist one no, i don't think i have even it. watched the playthrough of the ultra liberal one um i can spoil something in the or you can tell me to fuck off and i won't on it honestly go for it like i just the, i'm in the reddit all the time anyway so it's gonna it's bound um, to happen at some point there's a so if you pursue the ultra liberal quest, um, mm. you end up so through the mega light, bend, mega rich light bending, mm. convince him shares, which then gives you capital. But um, yeah. in order to fully achieve it, idiot doom spiral decides that brand manager, uh -huh. perfect brand manager. Long story short, he does all of this for you in very typically alcoholic. Um, way that he do it but one of the conditions you can give him is that he has to get off the booze mm -hmm. and there's this whole arc where you eventually reduce him down to i know you reduce the amount of drinks i think and there's this lovely little hopeful step in the right direction for both harry and did you are obviously shared um experience with him. honestly like it, it it, the way that it flips from being this absurd, hilarious quest with Doomspark flips and turns into this really hopeful experience. So I highly, well, it's, anyone who's... Yeah. You've had it spoiled now, so don't bother going and playing. But, um, well, <laughs> I would probably... Like, this is the thing, right, is you kind of play for... Not for the plot, but for the dialogue, right? Like, I could definitely knowing all, all that happens i'd probably still go and and do it and still be yeah yeah I'd, still have I'd, a fantastic meaningful experience you would, you which would. is wonderful because there's lots of stuff yeah. that i've not included there's a lot of really really funny lines but i highly recommend yeah. a lot of people probably it's probably the funniest yeah because it's very that's that's a bold claim because the fascist playthrough is is also pretty that's pretty crazy. <laughs> like the, I... the where, yeah, where it goes is is very funny as well. I mean, like with Measurehead being a semen rete retention, yeah, item and retention, bummies. yeah. Um, I read a <laughs> no, actually, I'm not gonna go. <laughs> no, go on. I was gonna say that there is a really funny part that builds up to um, being fascist, where you have all the stomach trues say that, like all of a sudden. Like Harry's trying to reason with himself 
or his endurance. Mm. Like, fascism's not about anything but like national pride. And, all. and then his stomach saying, no, 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 it's about woe men. They need to get back in the yeah. fucking kitchen. You're like, what the fuck is going on? Like, where is this going? Um, so, yeah, I, I do agree. It's hilarious. But, yeah, there's just something about the ultra-liberal. So the ultra-liberal quest is very, you know, like a lot of the art cop, um, self critique stuff that kind of making mm. a joke about themselves and just the idea of capital criticized. Mm. So I highly recommend it. I gotta play it. Um, what would be your character build? What would you recommend the character build? I would recommend the one I did my first playthrough with, which was just the sensitive build. Um, I had a really great time with that one. I think I'm the kind of person who definitely like prefer, prefers that sort of empathic playthrough type style, but I think it works really well for this game because this game is about relationships with people and you really get well, cut to the core, I think, when you have a pretty high empathy build. Of course, like... I think that's what's very impressive about the game is like there's 26 skills and yet like I think you do get a fairly even balance of all of them being useful or like necessary in any yep. moment. But um, yeah, between Inland Empire, your tie talking to you um, and like empathy and being able to clear checks with like a cell and the working class woman and all that stuff like – um, I, I, oh, and I think also these are probably different checks, but like, uh, if you're doing the communist vision quest, like getting into that room, how much are we, yeah, we're kind of doing spoilers here. We assume people who are yeah, listening they must to this be not by play now. the game. They've got to know by now. Yeah, surely. Well, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't done the communist vision quest, but you go to like the meeting of communists between, is it Steban? Steban, yeah. And, Stephen, um, yeah, his friend, his name I can't remember. Something like um, something related to radar or something like that. I think, I'll find out. Right. Carry on speaking. I'll find out the yeah. Um, just that whole scene. I don't know. I like the tender moments best in the game because I'm a little softy. So I really like the psyche build. Um, and yeah, I I did play. I've done about three play. Through, I did one sort of high psyche, one high um, physique. The physique was definitely my least favorite because <laughs> it was probably just too aggressive for me, honestly. Like all the thoughts that Half Light pipes up with, I was like, well, no, it's, you know, it's all part of the game. It's part of the, um, you know, the, the personality you build for that Harry Dubois. So, like, it wasn't that I had any you know, philosophical opposition to what half Light was saying, but I was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like it when Harry's a bit more tender, you know, and he's like Agreed, a bit yeah. more willing to listen to what people are saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it has its place, uh, but I will jump to the defense of shivers. Which... Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I love, I love, I think maybe that's what I missed from my first playthrough a bit was like, I didn't have particularly high shivers. And so I miss all of that. And I, I did, that's sort of why I did the physique build um, the next, time Thanks, because I, I i think that yeah the, the sad thing is i would have loved to have had high shivers with like a high um psyche build i kind of wish i get why shivers is in physique but it would have yeah, yeah to you be want... able to just like have it in the same skill cap sort of category would have been nice. i think i think it was purely um about balance in the game i think more than mm. anything because i do think shivers probably belongs in psyche it's kind of the hair yeah. standing up on the back in very close mm. to the empire. But mm. I know when they were making the game, they wanted to have as many surprises, weird stuff that you could miss as possible. So I guess it was kind mm. of like, well, if we have all of that in one place, everyone's going to see all of this. Yeah. Stuff. Because a spree is in Psyche as well. So those two things yeah. kind of take True. you different stories, probably would have clocked. But no, I agree. Yeah. They're, they're all great. Uh, Echo Maker. Communist. Oh right. That's his God, I, didn't I knew it was some like weird nickname. I don't think they refer to him as Echo Maker in the game. Yeah, but... I remember him having some other just. Yeah, a name. I can't. I can't remember. Um, yeah. Communist number two. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, your signature skill would probably be Inland Empire, right? Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it is the most fun. I like all of the um, apocalypse stuff ah, about, yes. like, the pale and and the future and, and the doom of it all. I enjoy I enjoyed it. I really like um, time in bad feeling, like when you're mm. about to open the ledger. Yeah. Uh, or even when you're just about to open the trash can, kind of warm pain in not open this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's your favourite piece of music from games? I it's really hard to pick because it kind of depends on mood for me, but I think I um, have to pick Burn Baby Burn just because there's a little emo inside of me who <laughs> just, I just, well, I just think that boat scene is very special. It's, I don't know, I guess this is how I feel sometimes when I'm like on the fucking train or something and I'm like looking out the window and it's like kind of cold and winter and whatever I'm listening to, like some sad FM. Song. <laughs> yeah, sad FM, exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I just think, I don't know, there's so much that's wonderful about that song. It just the vibe, the vibes are tight. Like the production is incredible, like the sound of the drums. And the voices and the piano just going da, 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 da. like just it's such a beautiful melody. Um, yeah, I think I just I just think it's the best. I'm so it's one of those songs I'm jealous I didn't I didn't make. <laughs> de, de, <laughs> them as a group are insanely talented. Yeah, yeah. Like it across the all of the albums, mad. I mean, they can produce something as beautiful. Whirling in Rags 12p. Mm. Chilled night version. And in the same album, they have Ecstatic Vibe, totally transcendent, which is a banger. And I yeah. just feel so impressive. The but it's a good choice. I love Burn. Mm. And I know that you did. I was, expect oh, yeah. I was expecting I, I that think, your answer. <laughs> I I think um yeah, I think I would like to do some kind of like cover of that at some point. I don't know if it'll be just because I, you know, I'm getting ready to release my own music or whatever. I don't know if that'll be like in the next few months. But uh yeah, I don't know. I can I can I can I, we I want can do the Montaigne that edition nice. of the disco release. Yeah, exactly. The Montaigne. I don't think I would want to mess with the vibes too much, but just I don't know, maybe something with um I I can do like a pretty ethereal voice sort of thing in my production that I think could lend itself to greatness with that song. But also, this is the thing. I it's one of those songs where I'm like, it is perfect exactly the way it is, and I'm reluctant to like actually mess with something like yeah. that but i just i just need to throw my hat in the ring and see and then if i think it's pretty good then i'm i'll post it but we'll see i always wanted they want i always loved the idea so on my channel i did where i tried to tell a story about the game through different incredibly sad songs um mm. But I always felt like a, a desire to make musical. You know Bo Burnham. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. I haven't it? seen Inside, but I know Bo Burnham's work. Uh, well, he, other he, than Inside, <laughs> he does. Uh, one of the songs is called "Shit," where it's just about him waking up feeling like a bag of shit. Like that's just uh -huh. that's just Harry Dubois. Morning. <laughs> I was like, that's day one sorted, and then you, yeah. and just build like a load of. Uh, so much work doing the video edit here and i did try to do it it's hard very hard I don't yeah know how... no i video scares me i find it, I, find, I have a really hard time with video editing <laughs> do you know like i can get away with basic stuff but like more advanced stuff that i really want to do it's... Mm. there is like a yeah, really it's a, it's a learning curve yeah absolutely probably been doing it about 18 months now and i still i still feel like man uh favorite line of dialogue in the game do you have a favorite quote 
I my favorite quote isn't necessarily dialogue. I do really like un jour je, je, un jour je serai de retour près de toi is you know an the, amazing the, pronunciation. I speak French, so oh, I can, do you? Yeah, yeah, I can't. I mean, I haven't spoken it in so long, so it's very rusty, and I've lost a lot of vocab. But I studied in high school; I was pretty good at it. Um, but that phrase, I really like. Um, One day I, I will return to your side. Is that what it translates to? Yeah, yeah. Um, I really like it's lore implications. I, when I played the game, didn't get to have that chat with Classia about the return, but I watched it somewhere. And this was a while ago, so I don't remember all the details of it, but I was just so enchanted by that notion and the sort of um, promise of like the end of the world and, and stuff. Like I think I have, I'm drawn to apocalypse stories a little bit, um, but also one day I will return to your side feels very personal to me because because I have this relationship with my parents, which is like impossible. Like I can't, I just can't talk to them anymore. Like it's, I love them, but like, it's too hard, <laughs> you know, like they're not kind to me and, um, or, you know, it sort of swings between like over the top uh, sort of love bombing as they would call it. And then just like cruelty. And it's like the, pendulum of it I can't handle yeah, anymore and yeah and in my mind um I on my new album which is like very much about my relationship with my parents um I have this song called best case scenario which like in the first half is kind of about how you know even if we <laughs> ruin the planet and we all go and die and like we're laid to waste the planet is going to bounce back and yep. nature will return and it'll all be fine and at least there's that as a consolation prize if we do sort of end ourselves uh you know when accidentally I think, or on purpose when i think was that probably, i think when yeah when exactly yeah, precisely um and then the second half of the song is just the lyrics repeated i'm not hanging around i'm not going away there's just got to be something better and in my mind that has sort of parallel meanings to one day I will return to your side, which is like I can't be here with you right now because of the circumstances and because of all this history that has gone before us and all this history well, or the future that is going to come and because of the way things are right now. But I guess it's that afterlife, death, after death life thing um, as well, like maybe I will see you after this life and maybe we're both going to come back as like some kind of particles or whatever, you know, and we'll be able to float next to each other, you know. It's just it, I guess it's the heartbreak, tragedy and and um, what's the word? Just like uh, impossibility of like certain relationships and connections, right? I, have you watched yeah. BoJack Horseman? have and I, I was just going to mention i've got a very similar story with my own mum and yeah uh, the fact that yeah. your name mentioned in bojack horseman <laughs> well obviously that's very much about him mm -hmm. and the yeah fact that essentially the message in bojack is you escape past trauma yeah. uh, and, and the things that yeah. pass through Go on, what, yeah, what was, it's, were you going to make a better, uh, better point than me? Well, <laughs> I don't want to spoil people just in case they decide they want to watch the show, but like the very end scene of Bojack Horseman to me is also related to these sentiments. And I guess what I'll say is just that like Bojack Horseman is an alcoholic and he spends the entire show like trying not to be an alcoholic, but then slipping back in and getting out again, slipping back in and there is sort of just like a person in his life who's like, I just can't anymore. Like I just can't be around it anymore. Like I need to sort of get well with myself and move on with my life. And I think, yeah, I guess one day I will return to your side to me is me saying I do, I care about you a lot, an annoying amount. It would be much easier if I didn't care, Yeah, but I can't. Like, I actually just, I can't be here, though. 
Um, so I don't know. I think also, you know, Harry and, and Dora, that, that sort of, that's how I interpret it. I don't know. Like the, obviously that's a very different story and Dora's well and truly moved on and stuff. Well, no, actually like, I guess, I guess this is the thing with Dora, right? Is as far as I can tell, my interpretation of what happens between them and the events prior to the game is that like Harry um, is, yeah, he's like an he becomes an alcoholic and maybe like a bit hard to be around. And she loves him, but she's like, I can't live my life like this, you know? Like it's Basically, the same thing. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's and it's. Um, yeah, I just think that notion of like one day I'll return to your side burning on the ground <laughs> like in Beautiful. the center of this city that has just undergone a tribunal between like corporate fascists and and union workers is like it's Spread just it poignant, I, I think isn't it? Yeah, I think what Disco Elysium does a fabulous job of is um conveying the way that like political um, conflicts and events are actually fully intertwined with our personal lives. And uh, yeah, I guess the materiality of the world affects everything and all of us and, and determines our relations to each other. And, you know, again, I guess to again, bring it back to like my relationship with my parents, you know, like my mom's from the Philippines and that, country has been colonized it has been given to the u.s it has gone through so much and it's seen japanese occupation all this shit and so of course so many people from there who grew up there are going to come away with like insane trauma <laughs> you know yeah, absolutely. like colonialism puts this into families and people and um i think disco elysium yeah it conveys that Absolutely. In its story, he put, yeah. he put that across so beautifully. Oh, thank you. So, kind of the same question, I guess. Favorite moment in the game would would that be the lighting of the graffiti, or do you have another choice? That... <laughs> mm, um, my favorite moment is probably. I mean, this is everyone's favorite moment, but talking to the phasmid. Um, I think it's a beautiful way to sort of, you know, it's a beautiful penultimate moment to the game. I think it's fun that the final moment of the game is very kind of silly and very to do with like the case and like your role and status as, de as a detective, you know, and you're standing in front of your peers and stuff. And then it sort of ends with the rock and roll sort of track. Like, I think that's, um, yep. I actually like that as an ending because I think it's, I don't, <laughs> I, I think like life, at least my life is full of cycles of having these poignant, profound realizations and reflections. And then like the next day, just like scrolling TikTok and making light of like all the dark shit and just like, you know, yeah. just like really <laughs> just hang out with your friends and shooting the shit and like whatever, you know? And I think that sort of captures that really well where it's like you do kind of just have to you can you can, you can have the most magical brush with a magical creature and have one of the rarest sort of um experiences of your life and then you still have to get into the fucking cop car and drive away and keep yeah. doing the next day you know like i i really like that but because that works because the fascinant's there and because you get to have this insane conversation with this being who does not relate to human beings at all and couldn't possibly do so because it is it's a giant stick insect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. all it knows is eat, read, and poison mind. And you know, like, yeah, I just yeah, it's a it's a it's a beautiful just finale. I think I agree. Yeah, I, I, there's a couple of things. I'll there's there's a famous quote. I can't remember who said it, but like, um, to your point about the phasmid just being a phasmid, not able to relate to beings. There's a there's no quote like even if you understood, like if you and a lion the exact same language, never actually understand what any of each other were talking about. The frame of reference is far removed from 
like all of the yeah. words just none of it would make sense and what yeah. i really like about the phasmid is the game spends a lot of time via kim um and other means making it seem like a bunch of gooey but like come on this is pheromone yeah we never see any evidence even when the traps finally lose the locust you find out it's Kuno being a little shit um mm. and then you get to this moment it's like holy shit they were right the whole time and i yeah. discovered it and like there's a moment where like even then the game's like, like harry's like no i that's it i've finally completely gone insane yeah him saying oh my yeah. god he like whips the camera yeah. it's absolutely good moment yeah. very good moment mm. do you have any wild theories about disco release? I don't really. I think, like, I think I've just kind of read too much of other people's theories to have my own, you know? Like, I... Is there I'm, one you like, um, then? This, um, oh, God, I read one really recently, but I, I'm pressed to remember what it was. Um, okay. Oh! Not a, I mean, no, it's not a theory, but I'm always, I was shocked. Well, not shocked. I guess I was surprised to discover that Renee is in love with Gaston. That's not a theory, but I guess that was just something that slipped by my It's quite. It's quite thing. hard to find. I think. Yeah, it's, yeah. And um, Basically I don't know, I guess. Basically suppressed it his whole life, right? Yeah, Very proud. it's really sad. It makes me it makes me sad when <laughs> that happens. Yes. Um, yeah, I just oh God, you know, sometimes you got to feel sorry for fascists because you know, <laughs> yeah, it's your life could be so expressive and wonderful, and you've chosen this instead. Um, you anyway, like the, you like the, uh, the racist yeah. lorry driver, for example? I, I know you've yeah. seen the fascist play for it. Basically, an in. And he kind of blames everything but himself. And yeah. As Harry, you can say, do you know if you were a little bit less bitter, yeah. you, might, you might just actually meet someone who's willing to give you a chance. But until you can... Yeah. And that is the tragedy of it. But they could be so much happier. I do think that is probably the central tragedy of my life is like people who I love around me incapable of seeing how um, big the world is and and how um how many other possibilities there are in terms of ways of living and stuff and they're just so trapped in their own shame and 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 defense layers i don't know it just uh, it's so sad to me you know like people who literally destroy relationships when it's so it so doesn't have to happen <laughs> like it's yeah. so if you just like unwound if you could just relax, like it would all be fine. And but then there's just psychological shit happening that just stops. I just find it really sad. Anyway, yeah. No, I agree. It's um, and it's something we see a lot. Um, yeah. Like just, just why do so many people go out of their way to just be angry? Everything drives me drives me nuts. But that's a mm. topic for another day, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is an interesting one. Is there anything that you don't like about the game change? Not really. <laughs> like no one. I, I think I have to remove that question because yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I I'm, I'm, think, I'm inviting like yeah. big fans of the game, and I'm like, no, it's perfect. <laughs> I think it's pretty perfectly conceived. Like I, I've never had a bad experience with it or even a mediocre experience with it. Every single time I've picked it up, I've been like, this is so lovingly made. Like, you know, it's just one of those freak accidents that you get every now and then with media and culture where it's just right time, right place, right people, and it happens and it's the best thing that ever happens and then uh, it never happens again for like another 20 years <laughs> Uh, uh, if yeah. it ever happens again at all it's lightning in a bottle isn't it yeah, yeah exactly yeah. but you will I'll, I'll i'll let you and the audience i'm going to be speaking to martin a couple of weeks oh shit and i know that he's 
he has been given the green light. To... Wow, you've got some, you've pulled some cool guests for this part. Well done. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea how, but obviously people seem to be quite keen to talk about it. Alec Alexander yeah. Rostov is going to be on. Oh, yeah, that's great. So, um, I'm so keen. I've been so happy to see him and Robert Kurvitz be doing sort of like a bit of a speaking. Well, not circuit. I've right, seen yeah, like been one doing like from each, but I'm just like, I'm yeah. glad they're talking about their craft and their practice and the, their sort of values and stuff because I want to hear from people that wrote <laughs> and made Des Grillies. You know, like I want to know what they think. This yeah. is the greatest tragedy of all of the fallout. I haven't heard from them. So I guess yeah. they have to be very careful what they say. Yeah, um, yeah, and and I think that people make games as well in like the documentary they made as well intentioned. As it is. I think it only made them hide away. Even more. Like mm. the responses to stuff, and there was a lot of criticism all coming out mm -hmm. about certain things said about. Now that they're starting to like creep out a little, but Robert Kurvitz is. A... <laughs> I fear he's. Yeah, I think, yeah, he, I'm sure, I mean, nah, I actually, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about yeah. his life. No, exactly. So I'm just going to refrain from commenting. Yeah. But um, I, I'm really looking forward to, especially with Martin, because he was like part of the original tabletop stuff. Right? And there's stories that are hidden in this group of people's childhoods. Stuff mm. that they came up with during tabletop, the stuff that they were going to have, stuff that they were mm happened please be excited yeah i hope that goes well um do you arrest clash yet i think i in my first playthrough i didn't because of my partner's goading he was like no you shouldn't arrest her and he I was, was like, compromised okay. <laughs> he was he was he was compromised i um I don't know. I think that that I I I have subsequently done a playthrough where I arrest her, and I think it is it's an interesting choice. It's interesting, but I think it's interesting as far as you do it the first time and you do or do not. Like the the intrigue is in whether you do or do not arrest her, um, and whether or not like basically what your um. Yeah, judgment or empathy or the thing that makes you compromise tells you, basically. Um, I was like, <laughs> I think I was like, I'm going to arrest this lady. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, something like that. But my partner was very much like, no, you know, blah, blah, um, And, yeah, I think the she's thing, so, she's a really interesting character. I think she's, she's really well written. I agree. I think, um, as you touch on now, it, it, there's no really, there's not really a good result, whichever way you go. No. So if you no, arrest, I don't if, think there is. If you arrest her, you essentially give her a death sentence, and you could argue that some of the stuff she did in the previous job and stuff really now she mm. seems remorseful. Then on the other hand, does play a whole city like yeah, pretty pretty apparent how manipulative role in. Um, and then if you don't arrest her. Like she escapes and kind of have all of that to reflect on as well. Because I think by the time she escapes, she'd spoken to Ruby and realized the whole thing was her idea. Like everything mm. was classier. Fuck, I just let that woman go. Like, it really mm, was yeah. not good. Uh, but then she kind of points out where the trajectory of the bullet was. Like, wow, it figured me that. But so. I think she's she is very like. Yeah, I, I've seen like discussions about her in the subreddit as well, and I think um, I think her whole thing is just like she sometimes she's capable of empathy and sometimes she can look the other way. You know, like I think that's kind of she's a bit. I think she's I think she's a survivor. I think is yeah. an aspect of her character, and sometimes survivors do things that have collateral damage in order to survive well, but she, then also that doesn't make them like inherently immoral people you know like they also have the capacity to 
to help people and to um, want to help people. And I think, yeah, she, I think boiling her down to like, she's a manipulator or like she's, um, I don't know, like any other title, or whatever. It's just like, no, she just, she's someone who under the framework of neoliberalism and capitalism has done what she can to like get an extra edge over yeah, you know, people in her life, I guess, as it tempts us all to do. And, um, you know, I don't know. I think, yeah, there's just a lot of, it's hard to make any absolute judgment of no, her, very, I think, and people, I think that's the point. People are very nuanced, and, and you're right, that is the point. The whole, I think it's a test of you rather than a test of who Clash's yeah. character is. It's all about fine because the game does that a lot. It challenges you to stop sitting on the fence and make a decision, and that's one mm. where you really have to, like, Go so, okay, and you can sit on the fence because one of the slips to report in. It's month a little later. slip, yeah, yeah. yeah, like station call or something. That's it, yeah, yeah the station call. Um, but I think what you the the word that I really like that you survivor. I think it's easy to forget mm. that. Okay, she's made some acquaintances in. Month, has nobody, like she is on her own on the run from yeah. the powerful organ. And kind of have to accept that under that kind of pressure, rightly point are going things that they can do which probably don't sit right with them. And it seems that she copes with it by taking a shit ton of drugs. <laughs> and um yeah. you know, so she's bloody like, how like rock bands cope with touring by taking a shit <laughs> exactly. ton of drugs, you know? Like it's like it's the done thing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I'm on drugs right now. Uh, coping with the... <laughs> it's all the pressure. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Of this uh, conversation. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> does Kuno really care? Um, yeah. Of course all he does. Care. Of course he yeah, does. Yeah, all children, all children, you know. Like, I don't think Kuno is old enough yet in at the stage we meet him in the game to, like, truly have built up so many layers of defence that he can convince himself utterly and irrevocably that he doesn't care anymore. Like, I think you meet him and I think that's sort of why he wants to come and be a cop with you and stuff is like, he's still at that age where he's like, oh, I can see a light here. I can see some hope here. And I, I want to be a part of something that has purpose and meaning. And um, so, yeah, I think he does care, but obviously the kid has a lot of coping mechanisms. Yeah. He's, he's <laughs> um, essentially, yeah, yeah that's exa exactly what it is. Like he's kind of putting up this, Front because he's basically on the defense all the time. Got yeah. Kuno Esther, cool or lame or whatever. Mm. Does have the does have a hopeful say like if you go. I mean, you have to sacrifice him, but he does mm. something in it. And there's some nice moments with Kuno. I think where if you find the bullet in. Yeah. Out, little reminder. Yeah. Like Kuno's like, my pig's fucking got it, is what he says. And then yeah. I think like authority <laughs> chimes in. He's watching his dad when. He's... <laughs> so, like, That's really cute. And uh, he, he, he says something like, you're my pig. And he can respond by saying, I. He just, he's just like really, <laughs> yeah. he's just like really happy about it. There, there's a really nice. Yeah, no, it was I agree. Just, I really like Gina's character. Yeah, it was just an excuse to bring him up, to be honest, because I realised that sometimes with these podcasts, I'm, I'm learning every day, right? Every time I, I do a new just finding ways to spark, because not everyone will flash you. Yeah, totally. Uh, where would you have... So there's two more questions, by the way. Mm. Like on 9 o'clock or something like that? 906 here 906. yeah i usually sit at like 1 a.m so this is still like oh, okay <laughs> you're a night owl yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um where would you have liked to see the game go next if there was a seat have you had any thoughts about it? i have not had any thoughts about it literally i'm the kind of person who like goes into a movie and like refrains from theorizing ahead when i'm watching i'm just like i'm just gonna let the writers do their magic and see how this goes um, and it's the same sort of with disco and, and uh, the potential of disco too. I'm just like, I don't know. This world's so big. There's so many possibilities. There's so much 
timeline and history that they could possibly work in and I have zero idea what it would be. I I do think that the second game, though, shouldn't be a Harry Dubois story. I think it should be someone else, maybe somewhere else, you know, somewhere else in the world, just because I think Harry, you know, he's had his odyssey with with in in the game and I think trying to give him a new odyssey might feel a little bit just like a sequel bait you know what I mean like that kind of thing um yeah, that's a, that's how it feels to me anyway very, I just feel like he sort of had his time agreed and I think it's difficult because obviously through the the course of Disco Elysium you build him up yeah print yourself and one of the really neat tricks with Disco Elysium that requires you to have as you referred to earlier in pod this newborn kind of sense to mm. and i still think so as a gameplay mechanic that's quite important but as a storytelling mechanic maybe um mm. but i worry that yeah you can't you can't start fresh again with Harry. you would literally have to walk yeah. into his life several years later and still have all of the skills chiming off the same way um yeah have to be like an understanding of this but i don't know um no i agree i would like to see maybe like there's lots of different like jam we never saw jam rock i even like like, i think going to jam rock would be cool i'd be curious even to like i don't know i think revishal is is a a is a perfect location because of its uniqueness in the world like because it's in the zone of control and because it's kind of just been abandoned by like corporate structures and shit like that but also like what's happening in iran yeah like, <laughs> like yeah yeah like what's happening in these other nations and Seoul shit you and know i'm curious I'm, yeah maybe even a story about like someone like a pale driver like that's someone who also has memory problems because they're constantly going through the pale i'd love to like know about maybe a retired pale driver or something like that you know like so they, i don't know you know like i think it's actually a there's... great idea and you've just you've just solved the problem <laughs> of like starting afresh yeah yeah i do think that's the the, that's the crux of it though right is like yeah you need someone who presents a new i guess mystery it doesn't have to be mystery in the same way there was a murder mystery but just like something to discover right about this character in their life and stuff like that and i think yeah maybe learning even about like the pale further or like how the pale came to be through an individual character's life and then their like implanted memories through the power would be interesting or something like that you know i don't know anyway no. <laughs> that's yeah, just spitballing and no no i like it i like it and um have you read mm. sacred and terrible air or do you know of sacred and terrible no air? i haven't i i'm kind of i kind of want to wait i don't know if a translation like an official translation is coming but i kind of just like want to wait for an official translation i don't yeah i don't I think Maybe... they did. They did it to Russian and English, right? Because right. Estonian to Russian, like doable to English, but it's still. Yeah, got you. Yeah, I'm. Just, I might see if like Pervitz ever publishes it properly, like with the translation, like a authorized translation or whatever. But um, yeah. I agree. Why? <laughs> Go on. I, I, I was going to touch on the fact that um. So I think this the main story is about some. Going missing. Hmm. Just in little shivers story. So walk past the church when it's snowing, shivers check that tells you about the sewer children. Right. Kids that live underground and kind of survive sewers. Hmm. I love all of that stuff. And I think the way that they, they captured like you really want to like show effects of the world you're in. Doing it through children is incredible because totally. pure, pure and innocent. Um, yeah. So, yeah, something along those lines. But I love, I absolutely love your. Mm-hmm. If I speak to Martin, <laughs> immortalized so, in disco forever. <laughs> oh, please, please, please. <laughs> Just do that. Take it. Go. Yeah. Right. I think I, it's pretty obvious, I think, what the answer to final question in fact actually i'm going to first ask you which copo type do you 
this. <laughs> you don't say art cop, there's something wrong. <laughs> Look, it's probably art cop. It is funny. It's probably art cop. Um, though art cop is funny because there's like, it's, it's, he's so pretentious and maybe I'm pretentious. I don't know, but I don't think I'm pretentious. He, he's, <laughs> I think I have, yeah. he's more of a satire on art people, I think. Yeah, to say. I, yeah, yeah. I always felt like it was the writers poking fun at themselves with conceptualization. For sure. Maybe I should just embrace it. Maybe there's probably heaps to, to make fun of about me. I would <laughs> imagine, I think I would die if I ever, if there was a, like a comedy roast done of me, but also maybe I need <laughs> the reality check. Who knows? I, I don't think I could leave the house again if I. Some of the ones I've seen lately are so savage. Well, they got a bit <laughs> nasty. They got a bit nastier over time because I think, like as a concept, yeah. they started as a bunch of people knew each other well. <laughs> you know, like it, amongst friends, you can say, like you can bring up the hurtful stuff and have a laugh about it. We went through yeah. it together and stuff, and and like yeah, we're Came at a point where we could yeah, exactly, and you can laugh about it now. But when you've got a bunch of strangers, comedians bringing yeah. up shit from the news and, and like, just it doesn't have the same warmth to it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, it's not warm at all. It's, um, like, it's just full it's on. So, yeah, it's full on. Yeah. No, um, I, I would just be the sorry cop. <laughs> constantly. Probably don't apologize for it. In fact, yeah, I even did it. To, I even did it in email correspondence. So, uh, like, <laughs> I have ADHD, there's like this, um, one of the main things I find with ADHD, always feel like you're bothering someone, right? And you mm. don't, like every single thing you do, like, oh, I don't want to keep annoying them or bothering them. But the truth yeah, is right. you're probably not. And they're quite, you know, people are fine with it. But um, yeah. that was, I'm always apologising, like, sorry for telling you this detail that you need. <laughs> but there you go. Yeah, no, if it reassures you, at no point have I been annoyed or bothered. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> I can live on free in knowledge. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you. That's yeah. one complex deleted. <laughs> <laughs> right, final question. This is the final one now. I suspect I know the answer to this one as well. Oh. Communism, liberalism, moralism, or fascism? I'm Communism. yet to have a fascist on, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'd be shocked if you did. That would be kind of fun, though. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no com communism, I yeah. would say. Yeah. Is there any... I feel like... Yeah, yeah, sorry, go on. Is there a long, driving, kind of communist leaning through your life, or is it more adult life that you <laughs> kind of realise that you rely more? I, I think... um. I, th I think my story with like politics is that I only really became aware of like the ins and outs of it in like the last few years. Um, I think I've always like thought that people should have enough money for like healthcare and to live and all the sort of what I would call normal stuff Yeah, <laughs> um, that does get taken for granted. But um, I, I don't know. I didn't really know about ideology and, and, theory and all that shit until like the last few years i wouldn't even say i'm particularly well read on ideology and theory now like i've read some stuff but i'm definitely i definitely don't have a comprehensive knowledge but um you know since playing disco and like you know watching sort of leftist youtube and and listening mm -hmm. to podcasts and stuff like that i yeah definitely communist leaning <laughs> i would say definitely marxist um and yeah, I just I just think that there's a lot to be learnt from um, well Marxism and 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 those sorts of texts and the analyses through that lens about the world. And I do think that you know laborers should be entitled to unionize and have strikes. I mean that's supposing like a capitalist world, but um, which is the one we yeah. live in. But um, you know, all that sort of stuff, right? That like until such time as we achieve a new economic system, which I think is a very, very, very long way away. Um yeah, I I, I want all of the good stuff for the working class, I guess. 
Um, no, I agree, and I think it's more yeah. relevant um, with each passing year. Actually, um, I always mm -hmm. identified as a centric, but I, I over like the last few years, I've I've felt myself being drawn more because the world is full of really blatantly obvious justice. Like, yeah, food banks have risen a at the same rate millionaires. In it's fact, so crazy. food banks have risen faster. Um, but still, there is like it's it's just going like that, and yeah. like to the point where even people who would I don't know five six years ago find as class on mm. pretty much living paycheck to paycheck. Dude, even me, honestly, like I I pay myself like because I I own my company and I'm also a it's like worker for my company. That's sort of how the model yeah. works when you're an artist so i pay myself a wage and my like company pays my rent right um and i pay myself a pretty good wage like i pay myself 750 dollars a week australian dollars mind you like it's going to be different the number for uh, pounds and stuff. and stuff yeah yeah but i pay myself 750 dollars a week that's separate from rent and like, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's quite a lot of money. <laughs> like, yeah. That's a good amount of money for a week. And even for me, I'm finding myself, I mean, me specifically as well, because like I end up eating out a lot because I just like, I'm so busy and I'm the only person who cooks in my house on. Sometimes I just don't want to fucking cook. So yep. I sometimes I eat out a, a bunch. Um, but it's like this wage four years ago was so much like I, I could say very easily and, and do all that stuff. And I am yeah very much like middle class kind of thing at this stage. And now it's like, fuck, like I go to the supermarket or the grocery store. And I'm just like, this is cooked. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, like it's I'm actually having to think about like the price of groceries and stuff now. And, you know, I say this only to just put into perspective how fucking working class people must be be going well, well, right this, now this, it, absolutely this and this is the thing right um and this is i feel so drawn to it um as like something that to be true drastically so i would i'm quite high up in a big corporation okay that's my mm. day job so i am well mm. and like you i should probably be comfortable but i'm not um back to life i don't I'm, but and i say all of this Fully in the knowledge that there are people worse off than me, and I feel incredibly passionate. Like, how bad must it be then if I'm like price what? Yeah, a little bit squeezed. Yeah, and I think I see it in variably sad, especially like we're getting to that time of year at Christmas. You know, and I always think like, imagine the decisions that parents have. Yeah. time of year absolutely and yet like so there's a there's a subreddit called twitch closed off <laughs> oh, for really? a long time and i don't know why it appeared to be, but it appeared in my the last person dude I, just quickly on that i keep getting recommended this subreddit called circle jerk australia which is just full of racists and fascists and i'm like wow. why do you recommend why what makes you think i would want this anyway go on <laughs> I, I think do you know what you know how phones and shit listen to you. I think even criticizing those things, I suspect. But yeah, like mm. I went in there. I was like, okay, this will be fucking fascinating. To see what these guys think. And I yeah. shit you not, there are millionaires in there claiming that. And I'm just like, and and they talk about how difficult it is. Luxury. Fuck you. <laughs> Like yeah. a million pounds would take an incredibly long time to run out. And do you know what? I always think if I had that kind of money, like Musk money, for example, all I ever think, and I'm, I don't know if it would be different if I had that, but it changes you. But I always yeah. feel like I could do so much good in the world that money. It doesn't feel like the people that money have that mind at all. No connect, and that rich subreddit really drove it home. It's like they are yeah. so far removed from reality. They think being a millionaire doesn't make, and that's what you're dealing with, and that's what you're like. 
yeah constant push to reach that wealth yeah yeah the thing that drives me the most crazy is i heard recently on the news um that australia the australian government federal government has achieved another surplus in the budget this year and i was like the Australian government doesn't need fucking savings. Like, why aren't we saving that? Yeah. Why aren't we spending that money on welfare and housing and like all this shit? Like, why are we? Why do we need this? They're like proud of a surplus. It's like the whole idea of government is spending money for the people to have services that they need, like an infrastructure and all this shit. Like, it pisses me off because, like, even rich people, right? It's like you know they could donate, but then they're donating to like you know charities and for profits, which like. They do good work, right, but it's not like structural work where governments actually have the ability to change people's lives well, yeah, substantially. If you, if you can legislate as well as fund then and make things law, then... Yeah, know. and these motherfuckers, the Labour Party, is bragging about a surplus. And it's it just, it's actually, it, it, it would drive you mad. It drives you mad. But are they, are they like to, yeah. our Labour Party... Yeah. Supposedly like the yeah, left. Yeah, previously like pretty left leaning for the working class and, you know, in the last few decades just totally just centrist basically. Like, like exactly left-ish centrist. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly what's happened. Yeah. We've got, say, like our Labour government put into power. They basically purged all of the really socialist party. And now they've basically but now like they've been in government and been nothing but basically mm. the same story as 14 years ago. came in with said got no money and you're the ones that feels like they campaigned yeah. on hope and now they're just like, yeah uh, hope left awful. so yeah. yeah um we're all fucked jess basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, right, that is, I'm out of questions, I guess. So, <laughs> I'm not. We did it. We we did it. We did it. That's, how long have we been running here? Look. About an hour and a half or two two hours and a half? Two hours, 18 minutes. And, so, thank nice. you. Thank you very much. Oh, Please. my pleasure. It's It was a great chat. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And I enjoy everyone. Because <laughs> we're ultimately. So I just want to remind everyone, Jess has a Patreon, which I think you will go and support. Uh, you have a new album on the way. You have a podcast. Yeah, that's not going to be out until Friday, uh, next year, like February. Okay. So, But there will be a new song next week. Well, actually, I don't know when you're releasing this. There's a new song out on October 10. There you go, everybody. <laughs> so at the time of this release, October 10th will be... What's the date on Saturday, the 5th? It'll be five days. Saturday? Away. Yeah. So this is going to release on the 5th of October. Ah, oh, dope. Cool. That's really quick. Okay, cool. I, I was fucking about with release. I, I haven't got the patience for it. Once it's done, I want yeah. to. Um, <laughs> yeah, cool. So, yes, support Jess's music. Support Jess's Patreon. Keep uh, an eye out for Tank Time, the podcast. <laughs> yes, I've got that right. Yes, tank time yeah, with my yeah, yeah. That's exactly. Sorry, it. I just wanted yeah. to make sure. Um, <laughs> anything I've missed that you want to make a big bit of noise about? Um, I stream on Twitch every Thursday. I usually do music production, but sometimes I do like Minecraft or other games. I played disco nice. like for one stream recently, um, and every second Tuesday as well. Um, and I guess apart from that. I don't know, so yeah. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Is everything under the name Montaigne? Yeah, yeah. So search Montaigne on all of those platforms. And of course, uh, you're already here by now, but support me even more um, because <laughs> um, we need all the eyes. And, and oh, until yeah. the next episode, thank you very much, Jess, for joining. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Doodle pip. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> I, <don't know> what <laughs> <to say. laughs> I free you up with Toodle Piff, but uh... <laughs> no, <it's okay. laughs> uh.